morning. I hope that uh, you are continuing to engage in the Word of God. I stole the music. Did y'all see that? I stole, I stole the music. Did y'all hear that? Fill me up and empty me of myself. <coughs> but I'm having trouble hearing. Um, my wife thinks I ignore her. Wink, wink. Um, but the truth is I have trouble hearing. And there was a portion in the middle I want to make sure that I heard right. Was it turn me upside down and pour me out on the ground? Man, I pray that today that, that we would be so divested of ourselves. Pour ourselves out. Because let me tell you, I can't get myself to heaven. I can't resurrect anybody. But when I get filled with the Spirit of God, I find the power for living. Everybody should say, Amen. Amen. Let's be filled with the Spirit today. Thank you, choir. We're, uh, or, you're my buddies. Um, you're more than just the choir, but you get the idea. Um, so, um, a gentleman was walking out of his local pub, um, and please, I'm not in custom telling these kind of jokes, okay? <laughs> but you know what happens in a pub, right? Uh, unfortunately, he was proceeding and in inebriating himself and went uh, out from the pub, and on his way home, he had to walk through the cemetery. Unfortunately, there was a freshly dug grave, and so you know what he did? He fell in, all right? Stop me. Don't stop me if you've heard this before, because I'm going to tell you anyways. Um, another gentleman that night unfortunately felt the same way and went to the pub and did the same activities and he had to go walk home too through the cemetery you know what he did as well fell in there you know what these two guys are trying to do they're trying to climb out and they can't get out of the hole they can't get out of the hole I mean they're just trying as hard as they can to climb out of the hole can't climb out of the hole uh, can't even with each other's help because well they're not in their right minds okay and uh, later that night you, you've heard it a third one, out at the same pub, trying doing something he shouldn't have been doing, goes, has to walk home through the cemetery, walks home through the cemetery, falls in again, and he's standing there looking up, but he doesn't see the other two guys in there. And the other two guys look at themselves and see the third guy in there. And they look at the third guy and say, no matter what you do, I'm sorry, you just can't get out of here. You know, that guy jumped right up out of that grave and ran out. <laughs> why, why do I tell you that story? Because when you come into contact, with something living that you thought was dead, it will change your life forever. When you come into contact with something living that you thought was dead, it should change your life forever. If you have your Bibles, one of the last sermon series today of after Easter and the question that we've been discussing, and we're going to be in Luke chapter 24, the, the last few verses, the question that we've been discussing is, what do I do with the resurrected Jesus Christ? What do I do with a resurrected Jesus? It, it, we understand the, the Jesus that died on the cross. We understand that He died and His blood covered us. But there is something different about the resurrection that should change us. Okay? And so let, let me put it in modern my, your, or, or, or vernacular. Let me just communicate it like this. And so I'm going to step on your toes. We understand coming and sitting in a pew and hearing a sermon or singing a song. But when does Jesus change our lives? When does He change our lives? And so, what do I do with the resurrected Jesus Christ? Um, I need to turn my Bible there too, I guess. Uh, Luke chapter 24, the end. Uh, so the guys have gone to walk to Emmaus, and they've, they've come back from Emmaus. Um, and I'm kind of skipping a portion of the second story. And we're going to pick up in verse 45. Then He, then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures he told them this is what the well, excuse me he told them this is what is written the christ will suffer will rise from the dead on the third day and, re and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in the name to all in his name to all nations beginning at jerusalem you are witnesses of these things and i'm going to send you what my father has promised but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power for, uh, with power from on high. When he had led them out of the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he lifted them and was taken up into heaven. And then they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they stayed continually at the temple, praising God. Let's pray together. And Heavenly Father, uh, I ask that during this space and during this time that we have here together, we have a dynamic encounter with you. 
do not want to walk out if you're the same Daniel that I walked in. And I pray that the same for each of us. Fill up all of my inadequacies and meet us, resurrected Jesus, on our journey. And I pray this in his holy name. Amen. Um, so we've got Jesus who was um, crucified, he's resurrected, he's visited the people on uh, in a, uh, these two disciples walking towards Emmaus, Cleopas and Luke, and now he's, he's journeyed, he appeared to another group of disciples, and he opened up the scriptures and spoke with the people, with his disciples there. And I want you to look at verse 45 and notice in the first few verses what happens to the people when Jesus opens the scriptures. Their minds are opened. Their minds are open. That's not a point. You're not going to find that up there on the screen. This is free. Are you ready? Oh, that we would be a people whose minds are opened from the Word of God. I mean, how, how easily uh, do we place... Uh, you're going to go home today. If you brought your Bible, if you've got it on your phone, great. I hope you read it on a regular basis. But how easy is it also for us to neglect the Word of God? All right? And, and not just the words of God. I'm talking about the teachings, the proclamation uh, uh, of what he says, from, whether it be from the pulpit or from a Sunday school classroom. You know what my, our prayer was leaving the 830 service this morning? Our prayer leaving the 830 service this morning was that as we walked into Sunday school, we would find revival because we realized that it's the teachings of Jesus Christ that opens up our hearts and minds. Oh, that we would be a people who are set afire by what Jesus said to us. And so that it, does, it should convict us a little bit. Let, let's be convicted a little bit. If we are not set afire today, we want to get our Christianity straightened out. We want to get our faith and, and our relationship with Jesus Christ straightened out. Because trust me, when you come into contact with a resurrected Jesus Christ, whatever He says will probably set you on fire on the inside. So that makes me ask myself, Daniel, when you're not set on fire from the Word of God, from studying the teachings of Jesus Christ, from being like Christ, if you're not set on fire from that, who's in control of your life? And who's your Jesus? Um, so Jesus is teaching. He teaches the prophecy that, Jesus, that the Christ must suffer, must be resurrected, and then uh, He gives them a gift, promises of, of, of a gift, and then He tells them to stay in the city. The city they're supposed to stay in is Jerusalem. Okay? They're supposed to stay in the city and then wait for him. And then verse 50 is where we're going to pick up. And we're just going to, we're going to nitpick a few things together and grab a hold of them, okay? Verse 50, when he had led them out of the vicinity of Bethany. Do you remember where Bethany is? All right, do you remember who's from? Let's, let's just, I mean, it's okay if you don't. But do you remember who is from Bethany? Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Okay? Lazarus being one of the few people who have been resurrected from the dead. All right? R Lazarus uh, is there, and I wonder if they took a few minutes, or I wonder if Martha, Mary, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus come out about two miles away. They're about two miles away from Jerusalem. They come out from Bethany. I wonder if they meet Jesus there. And I wonder if Lazarus is standing there, because I think they came out and they met him there. I wonder if Lazarus is standing there and saying, I get it. I totally get it. I, I, I understand the resurrection. Why? Because I was dead and I've been resurrected. Jesus says to Martha, Martha comes to him and says, Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Do you remember what Jesus replied and said? But I am the resurrection and the life. His proclamation then was, and then Mar Martha's response would have been one of our response. I know Jesus. I know that he will rise again at the second. You know what I'm saying? I know that he'll rise again. We would say, I know he'll rise again at the second coming. And that's not what Jesus was talking about. Jesus looked at her and said, No, I'm the resurrection and the life now. I provide life now. I provide life for the living and I provide life for the dead. And he told Lazarus to get up. Because Jesus is the provider of life. He's the resurrection now. And so he's walking around planet earth these days, these 40 days that he's been alive. And he's preaching and he's teaching and he's showing people not just that he died on the cross, but that he is life right now, not normal life. But the supernatural, God-filled life that changes things. And so, the word that we're going to nitpick for the first point is led. 
he led them uh, from uh, out out to the, the vicinity of to the vicinity of Bethany. It's just a simple point. What do you do with the resurrected Jesus? I want to spell it out for you today. Number one, we follow him. Wherever he leads, I'll go. This is a unique phrasing, and we find Jesus doing some leading all throughout Scripture. He's always leading. I just want to point out four areas that Jesus leads. The first point, the the area that I want to point out that Jesus leads is that he leads the blind man out of the city. Do you remember when he led the blind man out of the city? What did he do with the blind man when he got out of the city? Made him see. So here's a few points for you. Those of us who, who follow the leadership of Jesus Christ might be able to participate in the miraculous. But we want the miraculous without the participation. Okay? We, we, we want to say, Jesus, please bless my mess and please tell me. Sometimes Jesus does come in and divinely rescue. But for those of us who follow where he leads, maybe we'll get the opportunity to be healed of our blindness and to be able to participate in the miraculous. And some of us, we can walk in here, and let's confess together today, I'm a little bit spiritually blind. I'm having trouble seeing something in my life right now, and I need to be healed of that. I'm having a little trouble seeing my own sin or perceiving what God wants me to do in my world today, and I want to be healed from that. Jesus, will you lead me? Okay? Second uh, point that I want to tell you about uh, uh, Jesus and his leadership or, or a point that he talks about leading he says, he says in uh, John, he leads his sheep in and out of the pasture. You remember that little phrasing? Jesus says, I am the gatekeeper. And anybody who comes to me, I know my sheep. I know their names. They come in by my gate. You get the idea, right? And in that discussion, we often think that sheep are, are dumb or stupid. And I've told you this several times. I've never thought that way. I mean, sheep need leadership, yes, but I need leadership. I think sheep are brave because they're willing to follow their master. Are we willing to follow our master? Because Jesus leads his sheep, and in the passage, he leads his sheep in and out of the pasture. So we come into the pasture. It's called the in part of the pasture, the congregation, not just the church building. And I'm so thankful we have a safe church to meet in. Okay, We always are talking, man, I wish our church had this or I wish our church had that. I'm thankful that we've got a building to meet in today, okay? Um, that's air-conditioned. Wow, can you imagine not worshiping in here without any air conditioning today? Um, I digress, I'm sorry. But we get led in and we worship together. The ties that bind us are important. This fellowship that we have. So look around at your brothers and sisters. He leads us in here. The Scriptures tells us, that by, excuse me, the Holy Spirit leads us into the very throne room of God. I don't get to get in the throne room unless I have the invitation. He leads us. And the reason why I want you to look at each other is because I wanted to say, don't have anything against your fellow Christians. Because Jesus led us in here. We're not in here for each other. So if you're coming here think I'm in here for myself, no, you're not. We're in here because of the one who led us in here. But on the other side of that, I don't want to go too far with that. I want to tell you that not only are we led in here, he leads us out of here. And not the room, but the, the fellowship. He leads us out of the congregation, out of the fellowship, to go to the least reached people groups, to go to the least cared for people groups. And so you're sitting at me thinking, Daniel, right now, I'm, I'm, this is what my church experience is like. I show up on Sunday morning at 11 o'clock. I have worship. I might show up once or twice a year for Bible study. But this is my church experience. Let me tell you. You're only getting a small portion of the leading that Jesus does if 11 o'clock on Sunday morning is your only leadership time. He wants to lead you in here, yes. He wants to lead you out of here, too. The, the fourth area that I want to, excuse me, the third area I want to talk about Jesus leading is a little more difficult. Uh, Paul and Peter are, are, uh, often get caught up in prison. And do you know what happens when Paul and Peter go to prison? One of two things. Either God frees them or everybody in prison gets saved. I wish that, that well, I wish God allow us to be those type of people too. Um, but uh, one time Jesus, excuse me, Paul and Peter are in prison. Or Paul, or Peter, not Paul. And God sends an angel to lead them out of the prison. He, he, he opens up the doors and the angel leads them out of the prison underneath the covering and protection of the angel. Sometimes God 
God's leadership for us is our protection. We, we, we want this place to be our protection. No, where God leads is our protection. Our comfort zone is our certain place that we like to sit or participate or be in fellowship with our brothers and sisters. Our comfort zone is wherever Jesus is. You, your pew doesn't make you comfortable, your friends or your family. It, we need to learn to be comfortable wherever Jesus is because that's where our protection is. That's where he leads us to freedom and out of our prison gates. And some of us this morning are in our prison gates and are begging and thinking, God, please, today, lead me out of my prison. And he's already opened the door. Will you follow him today? Leadership for Jesus, finally, uh, not only does he lead us out of prison, <clears throat> but he says in Matthew, if you want to follow me, what have you got to do? Well, pick up your cross. Sometimes his leadership for us means our death. I don't want easy Christianity. Now, number one, sometimes it means our spiritual death. That there are things in our lives that He is leading us to kill. Things, I'm not just talking about bad habits. I'm talking about bad attitudes. I'm talking about practices and places that we should not be participating in. And, 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 and I could probably make a list, but I want to tell you, while I could make a list, I believe the Holy Spirit can... Excuse me, the Holy Spirit can convict us a lot better. And so right now, if God's convicting you of something that He wants you to put to death, today's the day. Because tomorrow, it might take your life. So, so there's some spiritual things He's calling us to put to death, but, but don't, don't miss it. Because He's not just asking for our spiritual deaths. He's asking for your entire life. And some of us, some of us, He calls to pay the ultimate price and to sell off, our, sell off our life for Him today. He wants your life. And He says, if you follow Me, I'll lead you to the crucifixion. Not just His, but ours as well. <clears throat> but Okay, so I think I've made my point. Are you with me? When you come into contact with Jesus, what do we do? We follow. He leads, we follow. I mean, it... But Jesus is now leading them now. So there's our catch where he's leading them out to Bethany. And he raises his hand like a priest would. All right, the Targum, which is the Jewish um, uh, commentary on the Holy Scriptures, said that the regular priests like me, the normal, the average priest, all right, they can raise their hands in blessing to their shoulders. Okay? And they, they pull their hands out and they raise them. And this is how they bless the congregation at the end of every service. The high priest once a year can, can raise his hand in blessing. And he has a, a special headdress on, and he can only raise his hand below the headdress. All right, so Jesus is, is now uh, resurrected. He is alive. He raises his hands, and what do they see? Nail piercings. He raises his hand like the high priest and, and blesses them. Um, and so what he's doing is... Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, if you ever read it, it's a radical book. Um, and uh, one portion of that, Jesus is declared to be the better high priest. Why is he the better high priest? Because every high priest had to continually offer sacrifices day after day, month after month, year after year. They had to continually offer sacrifices as if their sacrifice that these human priests were offering were never totally complete. But the sacrifice that Jesus offers is the one sacrifice for all. There is no more repetition. This is it. And so he stands up not as a normal high priest. He stands up as the better high priest. He is the best high priest. His sacrifice is sufficient and enough. And it is done. And he blesses the people. So are you ready for this one? Those who follow the leadership of the Lord can receive the blessing of Jesus Christ. We want the blessing with no leadership. But he offers blessing to those who follow him. We, it's, now, please, I'm not telling you you work towards your salvation. That's all on the cross of Jesus Christ. But I want to tell you, if you come into contact with the resurrected Lord, you start following. And as you follow, you get his blessing. Um, I've got this cool little app on my phone. I showed it to, to our earlier group, too. And they looked at me just like you are. You're bringing out your phone in church. 
Uh, who likes to shop at Kohl's? Thank you. You do too? Great to go, bud. I mean, we get a lot of nice clothes at Kohl's. But when you've got a large family of six, man, I can't go to, you know, the Ritz-Carlton. We have to go to Kohl's. And we found very nice clothes at Kohl's. I wasn't trying to say anything bad about Kohl's. But I, I, did you know that they stopped at the front of Kohl's putting out the coupons? Remember years ago, they used to keep those little coupon racks out the front of Kohl's, and you'd come in Kohl's, and, you know, you'd find maybe a 5% off or a 10% off. They stopped putting those out there, and now you have to get them on the app. So, okay, are you ready? In order to get the coupon, you have to have the app. In order to get the blessing of Jesus, you've got to follow his leadership. Now, I, I want to talk a little bit more about this app just for a second because this app does something really interesting. Every time our vehicle goes somewhere near, and I'm with it with my phone, goes somewhere near at Kohl's, you know what it does? It, it, it tells me there's a Kohl's nearby, and there's like a 20% off sale going on. I should go shopping right now. I say that because I'm not, I'm not carrying Jesus like my phone or a genie in my pocket. But when I follow him, not only do I get his blessing, but he continues to bless me the closer I get to him and the closer I get to him and the closer I get to him. When you come into contact with the resurrected Jesus, you follow him, you find his blessing. The second thing, as, you, as we continue reading in this passage, they, they, he led them up out to Bethany and he lifted up his hand and he blessed them. And while he was blessing them, in the middle of the blessing, this isn't like, you know, God is great. Amen. This is, this is in the middle of the blessing. He's blessing, laying, bestowing the blessing to his disciples. He is taken away. And the, the Greek terminology here, I mean, we, we know ascension. Okay, we get the idea of ascension, that he rose up into heaven. But the Greek term, terminology here is more of the idea of separation. Okay, there became a separation among Jesus Christ and his disciples. That there was a something unique happened, okay? And between their life and his life, there was a separation. Okay, yes, important. You've got to hold on to that. Hold on to that little note, put a little pin in it. We'll talk about it in another minute. What, what is the disciples' response to his separation? They worship him. Okay, catch that. Let's focus on that. They left him and he worshiped them. Who does that? I mean, we, we, we worship people when they come into our presence, right? We're so thankful. So-and-so came. Like we're, we're so, we get so excited when Michaela comes back from, from school. We're so excited to see her. And we don't worship her, but you get the idea, right? We're so, we do special things when Michaela are here. I eat differently when Michaela is here. I mean, it's just great. But they did the opposite. I mean, Michaela would feel kind of bad if we started throwing a party when she left, wouldn't she? Wouldn't she? You know, Michaela would feel kind of bad if we start saying yes to Michaela leaving. I mean, that would be horrible. But this, for the disciples, is a step of faith. It is the first faith-filled New Testament worship. They leave. He worships. Why? Because when you come into contact with the risen Savior, you worship Him. It is the most appropriate response. They understand the fulfillment of the promise occurred. They got to participate and see it. They got to participate and see that Jesus was resurrected. They got to see the nail-scarred hands. They got to hear His teachings and have their minds open. So when that occurs and you've come into contact with the resurrected Jesus... There is a different level of relationship between you and him. I'm trying to define this well, so please hold on for a second. It doesn't matter any longer if he's physically in your presence or not. The separation doesn't matter because the relationship has been restored. And so he can leave me. I still understand he's got all my life, and I praise his name. He, he can, he can, and he never leaves you, okay? But, but his, his physical separation is gone from me. But spiritually, I know he still has my life, so I worship him. And this isn't normal worship, okay? Now, when I say this isn't normal worship, I'm not talking about a style. I am had it up to here with a style of worship, okay? Not talking about a style of worship. What we're talking about is the heart of worship. 
And the heart of worship always dictates your style of worship. Their hearts were so filled with compassion and love for the resurrected Jesus that they started worshiping God in the middle of a field. And, and be careful, because some people would say, Daniel, I can worship God in the middle of a field. I can worship God on the golf course. I can worship God on the lake fishing. Let me tell you. I can worship God doing anything. Let me No, I've never, I've never gone with that. Never. Why? Because if you can worship God doing anything, that you, then you might possibly be able to worship God doing nothing. And I'm not going to worship my God doing nothing. He's Jesus Christ. He's the Savior. He's the King of kings. He's the resurrected Lord. And He deserves a whole lot more than nothing. And so we worship Jesus Christ on purpose and for a purpose. Every single time we gather in His name, it is done purposefully because He died for us. Purposefully. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the passage kind of continues on here. They worshipped Him. Then they returned to Jerusalem. Why did they return to Jerusalem? Makes perfect sense, right? Why, why go back to Jerusalem? That is the center of Christian persecution. Uh, Herod and Pilate and Caiaphas and, uh, and uh, excuse me, um, they're still trying to persecute and, and stomp out the rest of Christianity in the immediate days that followed the death of Jesus Christ. Why? Because everybody knows that he rose from the grave now. And so now they're taking further steps and they're willing to go back to Jerusalem. And why are they will, uh, how are they willing to go back to Jerusalem? Look at your Bible. Joyfully praising God. They consider it a pleasure, a gift, rejoicing to go back into the lion's den. Because when you come into the resurrected, come into, come into presence and contact with the resurrected Jesus Christ, not only do you follow Him, not only do you worship Him, but now you live for Him. I've got to ask you, brothers and sisters, who do you live for? Do you live more for your paycheck or for Jesus Christ? Do you live more as a step of faith or, or do you live for your stuff? Okay? Do you live more for your families? And trust me, I love my family. But do you live more for your family than you do for Jesus Christ? Who's your Lord? Have you come into contact with the resurrected Jesus? Have you seen the nail-scarred hands? Because yes, it does change things. Um, I love the state of South Carolina. I love the state of North Carolina too, okay? But have you ever... I think that South Carolina does the absolute best job of branding itself. You know what I mean? Branding itself. South, everybody, and I'm, I'm considering when I say everybody, I'm talking like below Columbia. You drive below Columbia, and every car that you come to contact with has one of those little South Carolina bumper stickers. You know what I'm talking about? State of South Carolina with like, we love South Carolina. I'm a South Carolina girl. I'm a South Carolina boy. My favorite one, the state of South Carolina flag is the crescent moon and the palm tree palm tree. There's a crescent moon and the palm tree um, in the, with the colors of the American flag and the star stripes, okay? As if they are God's gift to America, all right? But you know what you don't question about the people, those people who wear those stickers or use those stickers? Who they love, who they worship, and who they follow. You know those people are from South Carolina. Do people know from the bumper sticker of your life, who's your Jesus? And how you worship Him. And that you follow after Him. Trust me, you see a dead man come back to life, and everybody's going to know who your Jesus is. And He's inviting you today. Come and worship me. Come and follow me. Come and let me change and bless your life. So that means for some of us today, that we need to step out of our little aisles that we're existing in and surrender our lives totally to Jesus Christ. And say, I'm coming to contact with you today and I don't want things to be the same ever again. You might have a spot that you're spiritually blinded in today. And you're saying, God, please lead me out of that blindness into the place of healing. You might want to come and join our church. I want you to join our church. Make today that day. It, it, it's not about being a card-carrying member of Lillington Baptist Church. It's because we love you and want you a part of our fellowship. So you respond. This is called an invitation, not because I have a card down here for you to fill out. It's because God may have laid something on your heart and we don't want to walk out the same way we came in. So you respond to Jesus today.
as we sing this song of invitation. Let's stand and pray. Heavenly Father, we just ask that for those who have made a decision in this time, that, that you would continue to call, that you would give us the bravery and the courage to make a decision for you and live towards it. And I pray that, Father, this will be a spiritual moment for some of us, that we've come into contact with the resurrected Savior and we don't want to go back again. In Jesus' name, amen.